Our next presentation is uh, Lex Parker. Lex has been our guest uh, presenter twice before on his beautiful ON3 layout. And as all of you know, by now it's going away. And uh, Lex has been uh, diligently working a way to uh, pack it away so that it ships properly and safely to its new owner. Has created a new presentation on details. And this will consist of a series of specific scenes and structures that he wants to talk about and the very, very fine work that he's done on these uh, structures. So Lex, uh, we'll have you present. We'll charge from the previous um, uh, presentation that I, maybe I can talk a little bit more in detail with. And... Um, Let's get advanced. Um, I don't imagine many would try this, but I thought I would just show this uh, one more time. Um, this was an attempt at doing some hoodoos uh, on my very first layout. Um, and I created these uh, profiles out of cardboard um, in sort of an X pattern. And um, let me just turn my... Okay, and, um, and then just cardboard wrapped around it and so on. And then the, the typical newsprint or, or uh, paper and uh, hydrocal um, snapped around it just to create a shell. And then I put a lot of uh, gravel and small rocks and stuff into the plaster Paris uh, soup mix, added a little bit of coloring into it as well, and then applied it all over the, the, the shapes and um, blasted uh, water with an atomizer to rinse a lot of the surface plaster off when it was still wet and leaving a lot of the aggregate. Um, so that's, that was an interesting uh, um, test, test case. The other thing this in illustrates is the use of a mirror. So if you see up in the back wall here, um, that's a mirror that runs all the way across the back wall. And it helped eliminate that, uh, my, my painted mural at that time ended there. And it, it was a way of not having to paint another mural on the back. So these trees, of course, are mirrored as well. And so that it didn't look like a lot of doubling of trees. What I did with some of them, like these two here, I shaved the back of the tree off and then glued it right to the mirror. And of course, now there's no reflection of that tree or that tree. Um, and uh, that added a lot of depth to uh, this back corner. Um, this is um, a scene from that first layout too that uh, actually now exists on Larry McDonald's layout. Um, the point of this is to show you that some of your structures should be uh, your rolling stock, like uh, for example, OB, the pile driver, um, it is an operating model in the sense that it swivels and the, and the, uh, the hammer is operational and goes up and down and the, the whole rack can fold. It's braced by these uh, two pieces of wood and it will fold back. So what I did is I set this up to do a scene where they're replacing old pilings and putting in new ones. And the, this, this is the flat car that carries the extra hammer and a whole bunch of tools and sort of uh, uh, paraphernalia. And it carries a low-sided uh, gun and the old pilings are piled up in there. So this makes an interesting active scene, not just something where a car is just stored or your train's just running through. So you can actually tell a story. These images here just show some um, additional um, pieces of detail that you can get in kits so that you can create on your own. Um, obviously, my yards needed to be protected from roaming cattle and, uh, and wildlife. Uh, so I built these, um, these cattle guards here, uh, pretty straightforward. Um, what doesn't exist that I know of um, are the uh, are the these grates uh, to keep cattle with uh, basically hooved animals out. And what I did with that was put a couple of strips of styrene 
across the bottom, or across the tops of the ties. And these are um, angle styrene. And I glued them to the styrene and then uh, strips underneath it to sort of hold them in place and then airbrushed them um, with whatever color that uh, you wanted to choose. I chose this black and uh, weathered area. The other one is open stock cars. Um, rather than just showing boards, the open stock car, you can put in a lot of uh, debris inside here, straw. This is all chopped up hemp. Um, I threw a little bit of uh, dusting of, of plaster Paris uh, into the car and then just misted it and it, it, becomes, it locks everything in. And it also looks like a bit of the lime that uh, is often uh, um, thrown through across the floors to kill any, any vermin and uh, any mites and so on. The bottom left is, um, is the start of a scene that you'll see for further on where I started to build up a variety of activities and material of this car that's being built or restored actually and I'll show you that picture a little further on. Again the bottom right um, you don't have to have a lot of people to to have a, an interaction but in this case you know, a single person uh, shoveling, you know, he's got a shovel, he's got a, there was a sense of action. And, um, and, and so that he, he's sort of reinforcing that, that little scene instead of just leaving the shed and a, and a spade and, you know, in the, in the pile of, uh, uh, of uh, coal. The, the, I found these I wanted to show. Um, these are examples of uh, real ballast and the variety that you can use. Um, not everything has to be mainline. And you can see here, for example, all the cinders and ash and so on. This is very similar to what I used in my yards. Uh, very fine debris. Uh, you can see the ties because it's completely covered. That's very typical in a lot of yards, and especially in Charma. Um, the middle one is indicative of um, the fine ballast, but it sits below the, the top uh, level of the uh, ties. Uh, they do settle and that's what you want. See a lot of fellows have the, the, the ballast because of the application almost flush across the top. And the one on the right is a little more extreme because you can see a lot of mud and debris. So probably a very wet area and, uh, and again, very typical of uh, uh, some industrial areas. The one on the top is just an example of the, my yard layout uh, using cinders. Um, in this case, this is real cinders. I mentioned that before. I was at, uh, at um, uh, one of the railroad um, uh, yards a few years ago, uh, and I was able to get into uh, um, the, the ash pit. I had a box and a sieve prepared ahead of time and a shovel and uh, and I sieved um, uh, several shovels full of uh, the cinders and got a you know fairly uniform grade uh, of gravel and uh, the has a head it does have a lot of uh, dust in it but what happens is when you put the the gravel or I should say the uh, the ballast on the track and when you wet it down with uh, a mixture of white glue and water, uh, when that, that capillaries down through and washes the dust down in, basically given a very solid lock base at the base of the, uh, the, the, the ballast and leaves all the, the coarser aggregate exposed on the surface. Um, another scene here, just showing a lot of activity, you know, with uh, in this tractor repair shop, uh, having tools up on the wall, uh, putting some lights with LEDs um, underneath for lighting, uh, chains hanging on the wall, just whatever you can find um, adds to uh, the debris and the, the excess uh, uh, materials that would be found in some of these shops. Um, the top right, uh, you can ignore the window, uh, is the um, a sample of how I built this board by board with a variety of weathered boards that the paint was peeling off. Um, it, it's a little, it's not what I would do today. It's a little bit perhaps too extreme and I would do it differently today, but it was an experiment. 
uh, which you can't really do with described siding. Um, this is an example of what, how I would how I weathered uh, water tanks. Um, the one on the left shows the entire tank, and in this case, um, I was able to collect many years ago the cigar wrappers that were actually um, uh, cedar uh, from friends that uh, smoke cigars. I collected the wrappers. And what I did was I soaked them in bleach to neutralize the red color that was in there. But what also happened is the gum that was in the sheets dissolved as well, leaving all the grain of the, of the shingles. I'd stain the whole sheet and then uh, chop up all the shingles individually and they're all hand laid. But the real point of this is uh, this, this particular um, model is to show you the, how, to, how I weathered the, uh, the tank itself. Um, these are all individual boards on the tank. And so by doing that, I was able to use rubber cement and then spray uh, paint over individual boards ahead of time so that they were the only ones that were uh, showing peeling paint after after pre-staining the uh, the planks and the same applies to some of the the lime deposits that uh, would, would leak out every so often over time but the other thing that I wanted to try that I, I'd seen uh, on the real tanks is when the water gets low, uh, the tanks will shrink. And when they shrink, some of the bands will slip. So in order to do that, before I, when, when I, after assembling the tank, I used masking tape and taped where the bands were going to be located all the way around in a straight line and painted the, uh, the tank. Uh, of course, at the same time, I was doing all these other boards and um, and then to uh, remove the masking tape. The bands are all pre-painted and then I would apply them and then just slip them slightly before they were actually uh, glued. They just tacked them on and then glued them in place. Um, and of course, when you put the decal on the, the, uh, the logo, I had to adjust the decal as well. So these bands slightly slip. So that piece there, which of course was cut and then I could slip it down slightly. And I think that makes an, an interesting but subtle detail on the tank. It's not overdone, as you can see from the full size of the model. The other, the other thing that I've done is, uh, let me just move some of these four images out of the way. The other thing that I've done is on these heavy timbers supporting the tank, I've just used uh, an X-Acto knife on the ends to show the end grain and some splits and running down the inside of the timber from that grain. And it just added a little more interest to the, those heavy timbers than just a blunt flat piece of wood. Gave it a little bit more dimension. This is another scene that I did recently uh, last year. And um, that was on, this one was on the, uh, one of the previous shows. And, um, the point of this is when you see the whole scene, it becomes quite interesting and, and, and uh, um, a little bit intense with detail. And where do we get it? Well, what I did is I decided to go through all my old boxes, kits that I built, all the leftover parts. And you got, you know, you, you really do have a lot of extras and leftovers, things you'll never use. And so what I did was put, get a whole bunch of them together and get them painted and then started assembling them on this, on this, this uh, platform. Um, I got this idea actually at a recent trip to Charmer and uh, they, they'd added this in the last few years and put a lot of detail, you know, and, and junk on top of it instead of just lying and throwing it on the ground. Um, in this case here, to add a little interest, uh, all the tie plates, uh, so they stacked here, yeah, some are spilling over and they end of the grass on the side here. So I add a little bit more variety. On the bottom right, uh, there's an extra uh, water tank spout. Um, I painted and weathered, and, and, and this is exactly actually in Charma what they had. They had one of these tank uh, spouts uh, lying there. I thought that would be a nice added, added addition uh, of a larger scale. Uh, but you can just put all kinds of paraphernalia and stuff that you never get to use again that for leftover kits.
Um, this was also on a previous show, but um, uh, I wanted to you know mention that again because it's a very simple thing to do. Picture on the right shows Osier, um, and there's a train schedule on the wall here and the telegrapher sign over here. Uh, and I just did that in Photoshop. Um, put the, did the, the uh, all the sign, the lettering, and all the schedules on here, um, and then put a, a wood frame around it. I made two of them, one's on the Chalmers Depot and uh, this one on the, uh, the, the Osier Deeper, Depot. This is the, probably the last thing I was building was the start of the, uh, uh, the end trestle on each end of uh, the Cimarron Bridge. And uh, at the base of it, uh, the cribbing that's holding up uh, some of the uh, the base for the the footings. Uh, and these are all sleepers in this case, instead of doing pilings, because uh, you want to spread the load of the the foot of the bent. Um, but it's a great place to put a, a lot of detail with uh, a variety of um, rocks and debris, and having a few chunks of coal that's dropped from the uh, the tender in amongst the debris, uh, uh, some tufts of grass and weeds. Uh, there wouldn't be many of them because it's you know, not a lot of rooting for it, but it makes uh, for an interesting uh, base underneath the, uh, underneath the trestle. And then oh, on, the on the right, um, if you really want to feel um, uh, a challenge is to cut the outer guard, uh, guard timbers on the trestle um, to match the ties. Uh, make up a little jig to do that is what I did in this case. Um, and uh, this is exactly what happens on a lot of trestles. Uh, certainly was on the Cimarron Bridge. And uh, so I thought it would be nice to have it, you know, have an attempt at, uh, at doing that as a detail. Now, one of the, one of the uh, purposes of this, this uh, demonstration is to show you that uh, scenes can have and should have act, action and activity. And um, they don't all have to be one, uh, you know, one activity. So you'll, you'll get groups of people, groups of things happening in the scene that makes it interesting. Oh, in the top left, uh, you know, there's a group of people chatting there, you know, with the horse and the guy on the bench. Uh, you got the wagon coming in over here to be loaded. Um, Oh, what you'd have to go back on the previous um, um, presentation to see the, this part here, but there's a group of, uh, of characters standing here having a chat, and then there's a guy over here up on the uh, sitting up on top of the uh, cattle guard, uh, cattle um, uh, pen on top of the uh, sorry, the uh, the wall. Um, he's sitting there watching the you know the cattle in the uh, in this one pen over here. And then the bottom right is uh, in, in the yard in front of the roundhouse. Uh, locomotives are coming in end of the day. And instead of just having a couple of figures standing around, you know, if you have them interacting to each other, face one another, the heads are turned, you know, in this case, there's a, there's a, they want as a pet, they had to, I wanted to bring some animals into some of my scenes. Um, so there's a there's a, a good conversation going on here, and then it's 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 reinforced with a lot of detail and again leftover bits and pieces that I've made up with saw horses and boxes and crates and barrels. It just gives a sense of you know that there is a, a purpose to this particular scene uh, in in uh, both uh, uh, junk and tools and so on. Um, and uh, the, five, the guys that come home at the end of the day to catch up. In this one here, um, side curtains, uh, what I did here was um, I bought a silk scarf. It wasn't that expensive. Uh, uh, very, very fine uh, weave to it. And I cut the, the silk scarf uh, uh, in the appropriate size for the the uh, tall curtain and the and the short curtain, um, then I <coughs> would uh, dip that, soak it in white glue and water, um, 
and um, laid it on a piece of glass and then collapsed it into little wrinkles, wrinkles and folds and so on. When it was dry, uh, then I, could, I, rin I washed it with some, uh, some uh, uh, very diluted stain just to give it a canvas look and then adhered it up underneath the, the roof overhang. The other thing uh, with, that added to this detail was the water bag. Um, I didn't make that, but uh, somebody, somebody did make these uh, at some time, a little white metal, and that added a nice little detail onto the, uh, onto the locomotive. Uh, coal, well, when you fill coal, and I use real coal and it's all crushed. Uh, when, when the tenders are loaded, often there's spillage over on the back. They're not always just in the, in the bunker. So add a little bit of cinder and dust over on the back here. Yeah. And of course, on the right, not every, not every tender is full to the brim. Um, they're running out of coal real fast here, yeah, and he's scraping away as quickly as he can to get the last of it to get back to, uh, back to uh, the yard. Um, animals and birds and so on. Uh, these are scenes that often get overlooked to some people don't always see them very, you know, unless they keep looking and they come back and they see them on the next visit. But up on the chimney, you know, there's um, a dove there, there's a blow up on the top left. Uh, somebody does make all these castings uh, and I had a whole slew of them at one time, so I'll put the dove up on there. Um, this is a telegraph pole that I made. Uh, Dave Burroughs, uh, this was one of his ideas. And uh, so I made a, 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 quite a number of these poles, cross arms and embraced uh, styrene. I put little pins in the top of the cross arm. And these are actually clear um, beads, glass beads, plastic or glass beads. Um, and at that time, you know, nobody was making, making commercially made uh, uh, insulators. So uh, Dave came up with this idea where you use two beads, one, you have to sort them out so you get one slightly lo uh, long, larger than the other. Put the larger one there with a bit of ACC and the other one on top. Now I did have I did have um, lines through here originally, but I've had to take these off because of the move with the uh, the layout. But that makes a nice detail. And then uh, of course on the cross arm, you get a couple of more doves sitting over here that add a bit of life to this. Um, behind it at the bottom in the blurry section, you can see on the, on the peak of the roof, there's some more birds sitting there as well. Um, a snow scene, you might recall, and uh, this was one of my favorite um, that I had on my first layout um, with the, uh, the telegraph pole. In, now, in this case, this isn't, really, this isn't sitting in this part of the layout. I just propped this up on, in this scene. Uh, to photograph it and as well as to show that not everything has to be summer, spring or fall. Uh, some winter scenes are quite, uh, can make some quite interesting uh, views. Um, in this case now the eagle, this was another white metal casting. What I did is I, I drilled some holes in the, the base of the, the, the legs. I could, you know, the legs and the claws themselves were not part of the, the, the model. I had to use wire for that. And then I fabricated the, 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 uh, the claws coming out each side with some wire to put a little bit of, um, a little bit of a, you know, a putty over them to thicken them up and uh, the claws on them. And then that gave a, a means of perching, purchase, uh, purchase for the, the eagle onto that cross arm. Again, as you can see, these glass beads and the glass is very, very realistic. Some of them come in in, in uh, like a light uh, sort of a bottle green, you know, if you want bottle green uh, insulators, they're available. In the top left is um, a shot of the, uh, the, the, uh, the coal for the coaling tower on the left. But what's, what's sort of hidden away in a lot of these scenes, that stone wall that's, uh, that's in, supporting this raised bank for the, uh, the, the coal dock. And uh, so I blew that up over the bottom right. Uh, I was able to find uh, a very soft shaley like rock and stone that I chipped 
And I was able to chip these away into, you know, with a pair, couple of pair of pliers and broke them into little uh, shallow uh, uh, pieces of stone and then laid them up with glue um, against a cardstock that's on the behind them and uh, made a very nice sort of a casual built uh, dry stone wall. And um, that, uh, that I thought turned out quite well. Uh, to do this wall here, both sides and the opposite end of the extension that you that you might remember on that uh, upper uh, track, and there's a low there's a low wall behind this flat car as well. That took a week of evenings. I figured I had an evening's job. Uh, well, that was about almost five five evenings uh, doing all that stonework. Uh, very. Yeah, time consuming for sure, but the effect I really liked. Uh, another detail that I wanted to point out, um, you, know, not, not, you know, nothing so much uh, about the rock work here, but the point here was to finish the inside of tunnels as far as you can see. And here's the scene looking the other way on the right through that same tunnel. Um, I usually would take a piece of cardstock and make a, a box essentially and turn it upside down and put um, uh, castings and rubber molds and castings on the inside of that to complete it. And you wouldn't do that, you know, on the layout in that position. Build it upside down and then bring it into the layout and then build everything out from there up. Um, this would be a little tricky here because of the curve going through it. So you have to be sure that your longest car, like a coach, is going to clear on the angle. Um, and then spray painting all the underside to match the rock, bringing the soot that's in here down underneath and through the tunnel. A um, little bit of detail here. Um, when you're painting locomotives, think about where the uh, locomotive travels often, so it's not everything is just black, uh, weathered black. Uh, you get a lot of road dust and uh, oil on, on, the, on the frame that's going to hold and keep, uh, you know, dust and grime and other, other junk on the, on the frame. And it adds for a lot of uh, interest and con contrast to the rest of the locomotive to make this interesting detail show up um, because it would be running down you want to have a lot of vertical brush strokes, just sort of dry brushing with the, you know, any one of the colors, whether it's, it's dirt or grime, oil, and so on. Bottom left, um, that's one of the uh, 20 mule team uh, wagons uh, from Borax. Um, I wasn't using Borax, of course. Um, I was using these to transport bags of wool, seeing as as Chama is a, a destination uh, for bringing in wool from the sheep shearing, uh, the bags of them. So I thought, well, let's use that uh, to carry bags of uh, wool. And because uh, it's wool and it's all soft, you wanted to have these soft shapes on the top. I had to add a few pins and cleats on the, the frame that, of course, didn't come with it. Um, and then uh, uh, I put the I put the um, the bags of wool in there, which I, which really are just mounds of cotton wool, and then I tied um, I tied the um, rope over it, and the um, the tarp itself before it was painted uh, is actually just a Kleenex tissue, just a single ply. I like the texture and the grain of it. And um, I had that pre-wetted with white glue and water. Then I put it on here, yeah, then tied the rope over it. That pulled down all these, these, these uh, grooves from the, uh, the tie downs. When that was dry, then I could took all the cabling off and I could paint this and then put all the cabling back again. And um, it gave that sort of very natural look. Same thing here with the barrel. I tied it down with with uh, with the with the rope. Top middle. Um, you might recall this before. I wanted to uh, 
uh, put rail into my turntable that uh, was used rail. So I drew in the flange, I drilled a couple of holes in some of them, uh, which represent used rail where maybe there was a fish plate you know, or a rail tie uh, from its previous uh, location. Very small detail. Um, it's, it's one of those interesting things where people who come second, third, fourth time to see the layout who hadn't seen it and they're looking for new stuff and then suddenly they find these, these little details and the reaction is quite interesting. Um, on the right is, uh, is a uh, coach and to add some detail, uh, I've added uh, chains and uh, these are um, a long um, link chain that connects to a hook underneath the uh, uh, underneath the car and then onto an eye onto the truck. So safety chains on, on the uh, passenger uh, trucks. Um, these also have, and they're not hooked up for obvious reason, they also have chains on the ends of the coaches um, with, uh, with, with a hook on, on one end uh, and an eye on the other chain uh, for connecting the cars together, um, but not on models. And on the bottom, um, it's just one of my typical cars. All my cars have complete detail of all the, uh, the piping and the brake valves and the, all the, the, the uh, shoes and so on. Um, the, the, these are important to add. Uh, not that you really see them in this position, obviously, but when you see a, a string of cars going, these all hang down below the, the side rails uh, of the, uh, of the, uh, the particular car and they add a lot of detail and realism to the underside of the car. It's a lot of work, but I think uh, that's what makes you know, models, good models, going that extra length. And um, that, wasn't, that wasn't the end, anyway, I jumped for some reason there. Um, these are the, uh, and GME, I understand GME has been bought out by someone who's continued making these, uh, these really wonderful wagons and uh, uh, it's nice to see that back on the market. Um, so I just took uh, three of their, their wagons and the, uh, the buckboard and decided you know, what details are missing. Uh, the main detail that's missing, of course, is the, the, uh, the steel band, the hoop around the wheels. These are all laser cut. Um, and of course, you see the, all the end grain and everything on the wood and all the laminations. But I took the uh, cut piece of styrene out and uh, airbrushed it uh, with uh, with uh, a rusty brown, and then glued the the ring, uh, the hoop onto each each wheel. It added quite a nice touch of detail. The other thing missing on most of these is the brake rigging. Um, there's a hoop here. And there's a long beam here that uh, usually put their foot on and push their foot forward to sort of <laughs> press the brakes on. And of course, you have to have something working on the underside. And there's really nothing that I could find on the market that would work. Uh, so I just scrounged around all my leftovers from the, the freight cars for a variety of mechanisms that I could use to create fulcrums to make it look somewhat realistic when, they, when the lever was pushed the fulcrum would move, it would push this, this beam back. So the beam then pushes the, the shoes onto the, the wheels as a brake. There you can see that, that brake uh, lever here and there and over here. Um, and then just added additional adding, added details for uh, some bracing and so on on the, on the, larger, um, the larger wagons. This is slow changing pages. Sorry about that. Not sure what's happening. Well, that's frozen or not. Oh, there we go. Um, painting, some painting uh, details for uh, freight cars. Um, white on the top left, this is the uh, pile driver uh, OB. Uh, it does rotate as you saw in an earlier picture from uh, the, one of the first shots in this, on this uh, presentation. Um, the, 
the white lettering typically stays longer on weather cards than, than the paint that is painted on. Uh, that's because they used to use a lot of lead in that paint. Um, but you do get some runoffs and you can do this just with a, with a brush and just showing the, sort of the, the leaching of the white paint, uh, you know, from, uh, from weathering over time. Um, there is an interior detail of that uh, uh, with the winches and so on that makes it quite interesting. But this, is a, this was a kit uh, that I picked up years and years ago. Uh, the Grams car in the bottom, of course, you're, looking, you're going to get a lot of oil spills. That's the really tricky part. That's, that's very difficult to do. Um, uh, and you've got to do it before you put the handrails on. That's very advisable uh, after deckling and so on. Uh, the worst of it would be running off around the, the dome. But as these cars pass underneath the spouts, as they're going from one, from feeding one car to the next uh, location for loading, for refueling, um, oil will drip from the spouts and then of course it runs down the side. So I use a very fine tip of a, of a, of a, a paintbrush, artist paintbrush and diluted uh, black paint. And if you use the diluted paint, uh, it's a little easier to flow and it's, it's also semi-transparent. So when it runs over, you know, like the white, it's not solid and it gives you a little bit of interest. Also, you get drops of paint, uh, drops of oil. So in some cases, if you're, well, it's hard to see on this one, but it just little touches. I just touch the top of the tank with the end of the point of the brush, and you just got little drops of, of uh, oil on the, on the tank. Um, top right is just, a, that's just another shot of that uh, stock car I showed you at the beginning with all the the, uh, the grass and everything up, uh, hay, I should say, inside the stock car. It added interior detail to an otherwise empty car with just bare boards. Uh, the, the reefer at the bottom, the same thing, all the reefer, uh, just, I just did washes down the boards themselves and um, give it a bit of a, uh, an aged look. Uh, in this case, this is a Murphy roof, and I, not many probably know how Murphy roof is, is done. Um, and I thought I'd try this with 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 the uh, with the model. Uh, there's the first layer, and I and the, for this um, metal roof, I used a glossy magazine cover because it's an absolutely smooth finish on it. So when it, when you paint it, you, you don't get that pebbly look. Um, so there's a one sheet of paper went on top of the roof and then because it, it, you can see when you look at the model you can see two layers right here then each of the battens the battens um, are, are wood and I wrap them and then cut a little tongue because the paper is extended past the end and then I just cut a little groove uh, left and right and made a little tongue and then what I would do when they put and I put the second sheet on I slip the, um, with the, the batten upside down, you slip the tongue in between the two layers and then fold it over and then it's tacked down to the roof under the, underneath the, the uh, footboards. And the reason for this is there's no visible, especially on, especially on a reefer, uh, there are no visible nail holes or fasteners. Everything is concealed and, and sealed. And that's how a Murphy roof basically is basically built. Yes, it's a lot of work. And that will be my presentation on the details. And I want to thank everybody uh, for following me on the last two in this one. Um, I've enjoyed doing this and um, certainly will miss this for, for some time. Well, thank you, Lex. That was wonderful. Your modeling is exquisite. Let's take a quick look at some of the questions that came up. Um, the uh, car building scene is interesting, says Phil Sellinger. He wants to duplicate it on his layout. Um, Reiner Bordy uh, asks, how you make the color peel on the Bordello? I'm the sorry, how I made which... effect, apparently. Apparently he's asking about how do you made the um, uh, paint peel on the Bordello? Trying to close my screen here. Sorry. Um, 
the the peeling paint. Um, well, there's so many methods. This I did this quite a number of years ago, and, and I the, the method I used back then was um, I took some uh, fine sponge. I usually use my wife's uh, makeup sponges, which she loves, and just tear it apart so you get all these rough edges. Mm -hmm. And um, then I just put a little bit of uh, contact cement, paper contact cement, um, you know, on a piece of paper. Just dabbed it lightly into that. Then I would dab the model wherever I wanted to get this peeling paint effect. Um, if you want to paint over paint, then you've got to pre-paint that first if you want a different color underneath. And then I would spray paint the whole model and then just use uh, uh, some masking, masking tape um, there, there are there are cement uh, rubber cement uh, uh, erasers. Uh, you can make one out of just out of masking tape by rolling the masking tape up in a in a, in a roll upside down, and then you just drag that over the surface, and it lifts the mask. It lifts the uh, the rubber cement, and then you get this you know these little pieces of flake flake paint off of it. Great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bill Hobbs cautions everybody that coal cinders can be magnetic. And this can be a problem in various ways for the old PFM and PBL sound system that could interfere with the RF uh, used for a chuff. Um, Phil Stock wanted to know how you get the red and gray weathering on the lower beams. I presume he's talking about the um, weathering on your lower beams underneath the water tank. Oh, um, not just um, alcohol or shoe dye uh, okay. was the base. Um, I use brown uh, shoe dye, and sometimes I would uh, add a little bit of a little bit of uh, black into that to get various tones. I never, I always bury them and brush stuff on. And then I, to get the um, a bit more weathering gray, I I would uh, take uh, um, some white paint. I use uh, Floquil a lot back then, so I took a little bit of white Floquil and just in diosol diluted, and then I could brush it across put a little white washes on wherever you want mm -hmm. um, to get the grain on the ends to stand out. Um, uh, when it was completely dry, then I would just touch that with a, with a brush with, uh, with, with the dilute of black paint. It, it, it would uh, um, just run in those little joints and I, I dab, dab it off with a Kleenex right away on the end and that would bring out the grain. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and, um, Dave Woodrell commented on the weather tank. Uh, the weathering on the tanks are the best he's ever seen. We have several comments and comments uh, saying that some of the best weathering. Very impressive. Looking forward to your next layout, which I understand will be a shelf layout. Since we're running off a little bit behind, we'll save any further questions for the discussion afterwards, and I'll turn it back to um, Russ. Thank you very much, Lex. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lex, indeed.